Okay, here we go. I just, before we even start, I just, I'm, there's always so many special people who are in the room, but I, there are three very special rabbis of mine who are here. Um, uh, Rabbi Dr. Judith Houtman, who is with us from time to time, thank goodness, because she has family in the area. Um, always great to see you. And two friends that I initially connected with, you've all heard a lot about this in the past several months, at Passover at Ramad de Rome, Rabbi Amy Roth and Rabbi Noam Marins. It's really great to have you in the room. It, like, helps my heart right now, to be honest. And I will remind everybody that um, anything I say in the sermon, any mistakes that I make, can, in fact, be attributed to my teachers. <laughs> there are 74 meets vote in Parshat Ki Tetze, and picking one was not easy. But I did anyways. Viki yihyeh be'ish chet mishpat mavet vehumat vitalita oto al ha'etz. If a person is found guilty of a capital offense, a capital crime, and that person is put to death, and you impale them on the stake, lo talin nivlato al ha'etz ki kavur tik rabenu beyom hahu. You cannot let the corpse of the impaled guilty person remain on a stake overnight. Rather, you must bury that person who has been sentenced to death on the very same day. Why? Ki kilalat Elohim talui, for an, an impaled body is an affront to God. Velo titame et admatcha, asher adonai elohecha noten lecha nachala. You cannot defile the land that the Lord your God is giving you to possess. Somebody is sentenced to death, put to death, impaled on a stake. To leave that out is an affront to God. You know, it's from this verse, this verse in the Torah, that the Talmudic rabbis, our sages in Tractate Sanhedrin, hundreds of years later, extrapolate from the ruling that we must, as quickly as possible, bury all of our beloved deceased. Not just the guilty, the executed, the explicitly mentioned in this verse. This is another place in Torah in which when somebody says to me, Rabbi, don't we have to bury our dead as quickly as possible? The Torah says so. And I'm always like, we do want to bury our dead as quickly as we possibly can, and possible there is a really important word, as we possibly can, but it's not in the Torah anywhere. What's in the Torah is that you should not let a guilty executed person remain outside overnight. I just take that in for a second. We offer our loved ones who have passed their now lifeless bodies, immediate and infinite respect. We honor the vessels that held them through their short or long lives because the Torah commands us to do so for the convicted and sentenced among us. We do it for our loved ones quickly because the Torah commands us to do it for the convicted, the guilty among us. reading the Torah against the grain. Rabbi Meir takes it a step further. What does it mean that an impaled body of a guilty person is an affront to God if it is left out? Zilzulo shel melechu. To leave the executed above ground overnight is a degradation of the divine majesty. She'adam asui bidmut diyukano. For humans are made in God's image. And then Rebbe Meir makes a parable to help each of us understand what it means for each and every human being created into the world to be in God's image. Mashal lishne achim omim. He makes a parable about twins, or triplets maybe even. But I won't lie, I think I was called to this text this morning for a reason. These twins were what we would call identical, but what we, are, what we all know, they look alike. Echad na'asa melech, ve'echad nitpas 
the Nitla, one of the twins became the king, and the other went down a different path and was arrested and was sentenced to death and hung outside. Kol haroeo to Omer, anybody who walked by would say, the king, the king, it's the king who's been put to death. When it was, in fact, the king's brother. They're twins. They're almost identical. Each have different life paths. To the passerby, though, both of them, divine imprints. The message of the parable is pretty clear. Each and every single vessel that holds a human, no matter what, convicted or commended, is not just created in God's image, B'Tselem Elohim, but is a picture of God's image itself. Each of us, that means, each of us, according to our theological tradition, we were separated at birth. And God is our half that remains fully divine. We all come from a single fertilized egg split into two billions and billions and billions and billions of times. And I, I want to say, I love this piece of Torah. It is beautiful and it is unbelievably difficult to accept, especially in a year when some of humanity's worst stuff has been pointed in our direction in a year in which apparently taking and holding captive babies is an accepted tool of war. I am actually not quite ready to see God's image in every single face that I see. And my tradition, our tradition, at least in this place, won't let me off so easily. Somebody else's baby is in God's image. That must be obvious to everybody. It is non-negotiable, though it's still challenging for too many. Their parents, too, no matter their deeds, each is a vessel that emanates from the very same creator who made you and me, because we are all twins when it comes to God, each and every one of us. Rabbi Mayer uses the Torah here in a way that it was never intended to be used, to challenge us, and it worked on me. It's a reminder, and it's one that I need as much as anybody else and the reminder is this, I am royalty, and you are royalty, and they, every they out there, is royalty. Even in the midst of severe consequences for craven actions, we dare not look away from the pain of our twins, from the pain of each of our siblings. On Wednesday morning, a colleague of mine, Rabbi Aaron Brusso, reflected Wednesday morning is the morning after Tuesday night, in case you were wondering. Tuesday night, many millions of people were watching one thing. He said there was one clear loser in the debate. One clear loser. A group of people was referred to as violent, criminal, and most bizarrely consumers of domesticated animals. Rabbi Brusso wrote, there is legitimate policy discussion to be had about how, do I how to address migration from troubled sun southern countries, how to create reliable monitoring and vetting capabilities along our country's borders, how to develop more legal streamlined pathways into the United States to reduce incentives to circumvent the few and narrow existing ones, and how to establish earned pathways to citizenship for 11 million people, many of whom have been here for decades who have family members who are citizens and live and work in all of our communities. And there have been many bipartisan attempts to do just that, to create all of that. But first, Rabbi Brusso wrote, we have to think of them, and here's the simple part, but apparently not simple enough, we have to think of them as human beings. Your nurse, your landscaper, your doctor, your neighbor, my friend, and more than that, a person we dignify with humanity independent of their usefulness to us because they, like every other they, are your twin, your sibling, a person made in the image of God. It is hard to do this sometimes, especially when so many of us feel so threatened. It's hard to do this precisely because we often feel this way, which probably makes it even more critical to confront. And I hope we do.
and may we do so with compassion for the other and for each other and for ourselves.